let's get started. So as it says, uh, my name is uh, Ramana and I'm here to talk to you about my own experiences in practicing machine learning and how we eventually we productionize it at Semantic 3. So this, uh, I'll just give you a short introduction to Semantic 3. I promise this will be the only slide which mentions it. But uh, what we do is we help e-commerce focused companies. We provide a lot of data solutions, intelligent solutions, and some of those are just there. So we do automated categorization from text to different categories. We do a lot of NLP problems where we want to parse the description present and get out structured data as much as possible. We also do a lot more, like unsupervised extraction, product matching. We also have very talented distributed crawling engineers, one of them is also here, where we help try to index as much as possible. So that's about semantic tree, but let's get started to the top right. So all of you might have heard about it, it's happening, right? So the whole machine learning revolution, people are talking about democratizing AI. So if you have the buzzword bingo sheets, that's one word for this conference. So let's go ahead. Uh, you might recognize this picture or you might not. The clue is at the edge. So these are the TPUs or TensorFlow processing units as Google likes to call them. And this is the AlphaGo system which was used to beat Lee Sedol. So this is like a future to try to replace us. First, this is from ImageNet where the most recent results for a few years seem to be doing better than human level accuracy rates. Images are being classified by robots much better than many of us here. Google never wants to be left out. This was from their I.O. where they had automated learning throughout all their systems. So you literally point your camera and then Google Lens figures out all the information that you're seeing. And Amazon not wanting to be left behind has its own personal Okay, that's the wrong picture. Has its own personal assistant, the Alexa, which of course is entering all the homes and then the data power revolution is here. And all of this is happening and then the next day you go to the office and then you talk about all of these breakthroughs. And then your CEO or your board comes to you and then they say, where are the applications? You are my data scientist, right? So why don't you go ahead and build all these systems for me? And then you try and then you fail, you try and then you fail. Because every time you see all of these fancy breakthroughs, there seems to be this gap which sort of jumps, you need to cross and you need to jump to make these applications a reality. And that's something which uh, most of us face, or at least I faced a lot at the start. And let's just uh, go through it. So this is sort of like a journey of how everything turned out the way it is. So there are problems about, when you start off, you start hearing all these hard problems, you face all these hard problems you need to solve. People talk about pre-processing your data, training, so which models do you choose? How do you start building them out? You choose this framework, you choose another framework. How do you scale it out? You've had a number of thoughts here, even distributed systems, distributed machine learning, all of these ideas of how you take these models and then you scale them out for the next billion users. And delivery. You always are interested in your users, so how do you reach them carefully? So whenever you start off as a project, you see all of these problems. And then on that note, I have like some bad news and some good news, right? So the bad news is that all the companies claim to be unique, they claim to be a special snowflake. The bad news is that you're not. <laughs> I don't think that you're that unique, that your problems are so hard. But again, flip it around, I think that's also the good news, right? Many companies end up facing the same problem and then most of them have worked out all of these solutions independent of each other, pretty much duplicating their efforts. So that's sort of like the silver lining which we really need to bring about and start discussing so that all these problems that have been solved over the years really need to be shared. And this brings me to a story also. So a few weeks back, some of my friends drilled this idea into my brain that there's a mountain out there, we need to climb it. So and then I get into this and then this is what halfway, uh, three days later, I find myself like staring up this peak. It's full of sand, you slip every two feet. And then I'm like thinking what have I gotten myself into? This seems like a really hard problem to solve. And then this other guy on my expedition he just tapped me on the back and he said, look back for a bit. And then, yeah, this was the view. At that point I was like, okay, maybe it's worth it. So even when you start off, you see all of these hard problems that you need to solve. But then looking back, it's always very, very beautiful. And that's sort of the point here also. Not to just look forward, but also reminisce on the distance that you've covered so far. And maybe that helps you to motivate, motivate you to go further. So this talk is uh, structured in four parts. Not necessarily a play, but let's see if there's some structure to it. Data, then data, and then data. So good name to try. The whole idea is that you have to start from fundamentals, 
and then the idea of being a data powered solution is what needs to be the first thing on your mind. Your first model on how you go about processing your data or rather building your first training model, how do you think about them? Integration. This is again something which is often overlooked by data scientists, but which I think is a crucial part of the whole ecosystem. You need to be able to talk with your other systems in your company or in your whole model whenever you build it. So integration is something that I also like to focus on. Of course, onwards and upwards, let's just see where do we go from there and what are the finer points that really need to be discussed. So let's start with uh, data. First there was nothing and then let there be data, right? For that, uh, we are computer scientists, so let's start counting from zero. So day zero, what do you do? You go into the office and then that's a problem that you need solving. Then you decide, that's when I start collecting my data sources. That's when I start identifying my metrics, which need to be known in order to solve the problem. And then hopefully you just go ahead and solve them. Seems straightforward. But the idea is that this is not the optimal order, at least in our experience. You need to start with the collection first. So it doesn't really matter if you have a realistic problem that you want to solve. The idea is that we start collecting as many metrics as possible within our own company, whether it's within the engineering systems or the customer facing systems or just simply because it's there. So just collecting the data and identifying the metrics, I think simplifies the later stages. When you have a problem to solve, you can short circuit it. You can go from problem and then solution. So identifying your metrics and start collecting them. Because I think by far that's the most effective way to become a rapid prototyping system. So think big, this also ties in because storage is cheap, data is not. In that sense, I mean that the next time you say that you're running out of hard disk space, just go out and buy a few more terabytes of hard disk. They're very cheap. But then realizing that you needed historical data for the last three years and you cheaped out on it, that's going to cost you a lot of money. And then there are numerous uh, data sources out there. There's the UCI machine learning repository, there are so many companies which are open sourcing their data. Even today we had the government initiative product projects which I discussed, where there's just so many data sources that you really need to think outside the box and be able to identify the relevant sources which might really fit into your problem. And another interesting aspect here, slightly jumping ahead, but it's about pre-trained weights. So some of these companies claim very specific initiatives where they don't want to leak their customer data. But then they end up giving you pre-trained weights which are optimized to solve certain problems. Like in deep learning, one popular approach is that for most of the inception model, you just load it in and then you use that on top of your own images. And sometimes it works fine. So think about pre-trained weights as also like a way of transplanting data which might have been used in some other context. And speaking of context, you can most of you will be able to auto-complete this sentence. It starts with the garbage in and then you know what's going to come out. So in that aspect, I think one of the important things to consider is uh, sources of bias because many times when people build out these data sets and they see that the performance or we have seen that the performance that we get during training or during our initial releases often is quite different from what we see in production. And that also is a way in which we realize that whether consciously or most probably unconsciously, we as developers, we as data scientists, we start identifying patterns and then we start fitting our data collection methods to those patterns. The sources of bias is something we need to look out for, together with uh, two other points, like contextualization and localization. So what do I mean by them? The context is, how was the data collected? Was it So very popularly in psychology studies, the students, first year psychology students, are the data set. So you're only going to be focused, whereas you can't interpret it to the general public. Again, that's a problem. Localization, if you want to do consumer behavior in India, you don't want to look at economic history of the Western world or maybe the US, it doesn't matter. And there was a very recent comic also from XKCD, the second time you're seeing it today, I think, <laughs> where you have data in one end, you're shoveling it into your system and just keep churning it until you start seeing some relevant results. Hopefully this is not how it's looked, but then most of your linear algebra is going to process your data. So once you have these data sets, right, there's a slightly bigger context in which you need to place them. And one of the most important problems that we have seen is about unbalanced uh, data sets. For example, as an e-commerce company, say you're processing credit card transactions, and 99%, even higher percent of the time, the credit card being used is not a fraudulent case. 
most of the time the customer is a legitimate customer, but then you still don't want to let out the fraudster. So if you build a model which has 99% of one class, you keep guessing that class is going to be 99% accurate. Again, that's not very useful because it's just a hard-coded one which keeps coming out of your system. So of course, there are other approaches to fix this. Resampling, I think we just want to talk about a few. So there's undersampling where you make sure that the overrepresented class is reduced. There are techniques like SMOT, which introduce synthetic samples from the existing one. And of course, you can use variable loss function. The idea is to provide an overview of all the ways that are possible to actually solve these problems. And of course, uh, like I mentioned, there are a lot of these frameworks which have been publicly announced by a lot of these companies. And there's the saying, right, about giants and shoulders. You just make sure to use them. So there's the text, right? For example, when you start with text, tokenization, soft words, dictionaries, embedding them in a vector space, encoding them, adding attention frames. Again, all of these are very standard practices which most companies, irrespective of the type of problem that they are solving in a text context, just using these often gives you significant boost. And being able to incorporate these techniques sort of gives you a playbook. So again, it's not about building your best model from scratch. You start to really ask what are the standard best practices, and I think these things really can translate across the domain. And of course, for images, not wanting to be left out, there are a few techniques as well. You standardize them to 300 by 300 pixels, or you widen them, you remove the average mean, you divide by the standard deviation, you adjust dimensionality. Again, most of these are applicable across domains, and just being aware of the context in which they were used often gives you significant advantages in how you can actually end up deploying them. <coughs> okay, so that was like a quick run through of the data and at least the pre-processing techniques. So how do you go about, once you have this well-curated, perfect data system, how do you go about solving it? And then I like to call it uh, pattern recognition. And you might think that this is pattern recognition where you look at an image and then you process it using your computer, right? But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I like to think of it as humans, we ourselves, need to be able to do problem solving by practice. And what I mean is just being familiar with the number of approaches out there. So when you start see something that looks like a duck, spots like a duck, what do you do with it? So again, it's being able to take a problem, identify the mental framework in which it operates, and then being able to solve it. Machines done by something called gradient descent, very popularly. And I like to call it something else for humans. Maybe it's someone else who calls it graduate student descent. So it's not gradient descent, it's where a professor employs 50 graduate students to attack the same problem with 50 methods. Or you yourself, you realize one after the other, you spend six months, six months attacking it different ways, and at the end of it, you get a PhD. Graduate student descent is maybe the way students end up learning. This is something I found from Scikit-learn, very popular. Uh, they call this uh, how to choose the right estimator. I'm not calling it as the best mental model out there, but the idea is that we need to be able to identify these clusters of problems which need to be solved. Uh, it doesn't matter if you can't read it, I'll make sure the slides are up at the end and you'll be able to check it out later. Again, it's on Scikit Learn. So, like there are classification problems, clustering problems, regression, dimensionality reduction. So, again, you start with this mental model within yourself. You think, what am I looking at? Is it a model which is computing a number? Is it trying to predict a category? Am I just looking for patterns in the data? And the whole idea is that through experience, you start to realize the models that would end up working in each situation. So, model, right? Start here. So, let's think of it as a problem, right? So, let's say, again, we are focused in e-commerce. So let's say we have this e-commerce website which asks us, how do you end up ranking the products for the visitor? So, when someone visits the website, what is the order in which you show the products? One easy way when they come to us, we build a complex model and say, eat all your data here, and then we end up solving it. But again, that's not the work. That's not the way things work, right? The idea I would recommend is that start with a simple heuristic. And what do I mean by heuristic? That's just a fancy way of saying hard-coded rules. <laughs> so, if you want a simple heuristic, you can come up with a way in which uh, you decide, okay, I'm going to rank my products by the number of views that they receive on my website. Maybe that will get you half the way there. Maybe that will already start putting the right products in front of people. 
the products that other people are looking at. And maybe that might end up working for a few months at least for your company, maybe that helps. And then you realize, views are not enough, maybe I should start sorting my products by the actual orders place. Maybe that gives me a better conversion. So you go ahead, you build a more complex heuristic, you start hand tuning it. Uh, at this point, you're at sort of a slippery slope. So I would suggest don't do that. <laughs> That's at the point where you start considering actual machine learning models, and then you start building a simple model, and then eventually you start working upwards. So the idea is that not everything needs to be perfect from day one. Maybe you start with a heuristic, and then eventually you start realizing the limitations, and from there you can start taking things forward. So again, driving home the point again, starting simple. Simplify your first objective. And what do I mean by that? So when you ask a startup, like a small company, what's your aim? To make the world a better place, right? Fortunately, we can't optimize that. <laughs> Unfortunately, feeding that into the model gives us uh, bad answers. So we decide we want to simplify our first objective. We decide we just want to optimize the conversion rate. Maybe that's a small enough number that we can work with. And then once you realize that you have a valid objective in mind, there's this trade-off which uh, people consider initially also, which I'm slightly biased in favor of, where do you need interpretable models. You start off with a black box where you feed all the numbers in, then it spits an answer. There was a talk earlier about explainability in machine learning systems, and then this sort of is related to it. Do you trade off accuracy for explainability? My understanding is that at least initially explainability sort of takes you a long way. Feature engineering is again very linked to being able to explain the results of your model, where you realize which features are leading to the conclusion, and maybe that's really the way to start. And of course, this being fifth elephant, the first four elephants are standing on top of a turtle, and then it's turtles all the way down. So ensembles of small models, right? Ensembles of small models are what win the most popular competition. You go to Kaggle today, and then you look at the top results, most of them are just people who put together five models and then tune the respective models and then they end up winning it. So ensembles seem to have a great promise and most of the time your simple model, when put together, it's able to deliver significant results. And this is, uh, okay, so the next topic is slightly related to something which I just very recently learned. Maybe it's useful for you guys as well. It's about model calibration. So let's talk about this graph. It's like an ROC curve. On the x-axis, you have something which you're predicting. Okay, the probability between 0 and 1, okay, that's the probability of a customer churning over here. And then you end up on the y-axis plotting the number of times that the customer actually churns. You do that multiple times, you see how many times they churn. So say you're predicting 0.2 that the customer is going to churn. But then they end up churning 0.5% of the time. That means your model is sort of an underconfident model. Ideally, the best case is along this uh, center diagonal, but you end up in this sort of model where it's underconfident. Similarly, there's an approach where you end up predicting 0.8, but then it ends up out of the 50 experiments, 25 of them churn, and it's like 50%. So this is something called a rear score. It's from this book called Super Forecasting. I'm quite sure it's popular in other domains as well, but this is something which you can think about of how your models are calibrated, not just in the context of probabilities of one object, but across all the objects that you predict. Again, looking at some other results, this is again the same graph, and both of these models are 100% accurate. Both of them are on the straight line. But the first one predicts its probability within 40 to 60, and it ends up being correct. The second one predicts maybe 0.1 and then 0.9, still ends up being correct. So both of these are well calibrated models, but you would say that the first one is a cautious system, and then the second one is a decisive system. Both of them have the same accuracy rates, but then these sort of ideas of looking at the model in a bigger picture helps give you a better understanding of how your model is calibrated. So again, autocomplete here, past performance, when you read financial documents, the first thing they say is not indicative of future results. So when you start building your model, the idea is to launch first, move fast, make things, iterate next. And this I mean in a lot of context, especially in relation to the next section on integration. Because when you start building out, the probability that or, okay, the system might work on day one, and then eventually the system will begin to degrade because people's behavior tends to change. So the parameters that you train on might no longer be applicable later on. So the idea is to get a stable pipeline in place, and then later you begin to iterate on the results. 
later you begin to see, okay, these things will change eventually. Let's build, let's build a complex model. Again, launch first and then later we figure it out. When you're starting with the model, it doesn't matter if it's really simple, as long as it works, push it through. And push it through to this page about uh, integration and the idea that the ML code that you build is not isolated. And for that, I have this great picture. It's from a form of uh, Google uh, published documents which talk about how complex their systems are. So in all my slides, if you see this sort of link over here, eventually if you open the slide, that link through to the actual content. So that should help you later when I post the link for the slide. And then over here, you look at the data collection, feature extraction, data management systems on the left. And then in the middle, you have this like very small black box. You can't read it, that just says ML code. So that's effectively the small component that we end up building over all this time. And then eventually you have a lot of these other components. You need to manage your serving infrastructure, you need to manage your monitoring, you need to manage your logging and the process management. The whole point is that you need to look at the big picture with the small ML model. It's not necessarily small, but the component in relation to the other part of your code. It's about an ecosystem which uh, needs to be built. And I think over here at this conference, the idea is also bring forward this conversation between not just data scientists, but also the engineers, data engineers that they like to call them. It's a whole new field, but the idea is to bring the conversation forward and treat them as engineering problems. Because blindly increasing complexity of the models increases the cost involved. The manpower cost, the time cost, the money cost, every single aspect of your project is going to be delayed if you just focus on optimizing the model. I started out initially focused on the engineering side, so this quote at least starts or rings true. It says, uh, do machine learning like the great engineer you are, not like the great machine learning expert, this I'm not here, yeah, or so forth, yeah. So the idea is that you need to identify the strengths to execute a successful product. It's not the aim to publish a research paper which gets another 50% improvement on the state of the art. Again, it's by Martin Zenkovich, it links to the actual document. It's about plumbing pipelines, the first level your ecosystem, as I like to think about it. The first level of the ecosystem, the plumbing pipeline, is about your data sources. You need to be able to get a solid pipeline. Again, there are excellent talks over the day which talk about how you stream data, how you use your data store earlier today, how you stream your data from your data store to your machine learning systems. It's uh, part of the launch then iterate, because the idea, similar to another ecological concern, is to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Try to duplicate the data sources as much as you can between your systems which are used for training and when you eventually do use them in production or when you use them for serving the specific case making predictions to machines and systems. The idea is that these plumbing pipelines need to be built not just within your own use or your small Python snippet for processing, but think of it as a framework which needs to be used across multiple projects. Versioning and testing, again, this is speaking as, a, as how you develop software problems, like right? how you teach your software systems. So whenever a new CTO or a new head of engineering comes in, they throw out the whole system, they curse it, and then they say, let's rewrite everything in the new country language today. Is it mode or maybe something else? I don't know. Yeah. So now they say, minimize whole system rewrite. And this, I think, is crucial when you start building the system in your own, in your own companies, right? The idea is to build something which can be incrementally updated. Think of it as using Git over your model. Maybe you want a version control system which has the predictions over how many accuracy rates or how many features, how many parameters, maybe the data set over which it was trained, the, the, the time when, during which the data set was generated. The idea is that being able to run a Git command over your models is quite crucial. And this often, is, uh, this often translates to a lot of other problems like uh, production skew. This is something which you might not have heard of, at least it's not a popular word, but the idea of production skew is how your deployment environment or your whole system which is running starts to deviate in certain ways from the context in which it was trained. So there starts to be this skew between how your system was intended to run and how your system runs. And one of the easiest ways to think about it is about maintaining selected features. And what I mean is, is that suppose today you are collecting the number of page views on the website. Maybe five days later, the UI guy decides that sending back metric information about page views is slowing down the website. 
so they drop that column, right? Then eventually your system will no longer be able to work with the data. And identifying these sort of features which are no longer applicable is something which people really need to think about when they start building the model. And for that I like this uh, diagram over here which talks about how you do deployments. So you have this development system where you work with, and then your code sort of flows downstream to your actual deployment. And then the idea is that while code flows in this direction, we need to be able to get data to flow upstream or in the other direction. Where whatever you're collecting in production, maybe after some certain anonymization is required and aggregation, you sort of get the data to flow back into your development environment, or at least a snapshot of the data, where code flows downstream and then your data goes back upstream. And this replication of data sources is also tied in with our previous stage, where we really want to duplicate the pre-processing steps involved. So when you start off and start using certain techniques in development, the idea is to try to see if just with scaling out the systems that they run on, that you can use the same techniques in your production deployments. And of course, uh, monitoring is a very popular aspect. Most of the most of us are don't know about the DevOps engineers who end up going somewhere else and complaining about their data scientists. But the idea is that monitoring is uh, crucial not just for a performance and uptime point of view, but also in terms of the accuracy of your models and maintaining its own applicability to the problem that's solving. So logging your predictions, and by this I mean not just doing your training where you do cross validation or you do your testing set and then you verify it against your own data set. The idea is to log it across the population that you're serving and eventually you start to see the trends that the model reports are consistent with your own expectations. Or maybe the logging eventually also alerts you to failures of your model which eventually you need to go back and retrain or refix. And there's also another aspect of this which I like to call A-B testing but it's also like a finer point to it where it's better sometimes to hold out your model from touching the users. And what do I mean is that it's connected to something called feedback loops. Say again, going back to the same example, you're ranking the products on your website according to a certain metric. And then it ends up that the first ranked product eventually becomes the most bought product. Now the question is, was your ranking the factor that actually caused the product to become top selling? What if it doesn't matter? You just take your first product and then that eventually becomes the truth. So it's again causation, correlation. So sometimes just ordering the products in a random way or maybe showing it to a certain portion of the users without touching your model. That helps you build what I like to call a cleaner data set. So this sort of cleaner data set can sometimes really help you identify that. These feedback loops can actually overpower the other features that you are looking for. So that's something which eventually the monitoring systems will really help you realize. Okay, so first a quick run through of everything. Yeah. Talk about onwards and upwards. So this is like the last section if you're already sleeping, like just a few minutes to go. Yeah. Uh, onwards and upwards, and what do I mean by this? It's uh, easy to get bogged down by the mini day, by the small points, and it's really difficult when you build these systems to look at the application or the purpose for which they were built. And many times having an idea of the bigger picture, whether it's a small company or a big company, it doesn't really matter, but you need to have a bigger idea of what the goals are when you start building these machine learning systems. And this is something which is quite important when you look at production or actual commercial application instead of just doing it on a training set. And for that I like this uh, aspect which I call walk by the W's. And by the W's I just mean the W question. I mean about questions like who will use the model? Why are you solving this problem? And what will happen? So again, these are the questions which when provided clearly, when understood really by yourself, really helps you translate how you build your model. Because things like whether the model is going to be used internally by your company or maybe externally by your consumers, that might translate the complexity of the input that you give to your model. Maybe you're solving this problem to optimize a certain aspect of your business. Again, that is the reason that you're solving it. And then what will happen? Like, are you planning on changing the output of your manufacturing sector by certain number? Or are you planning on optimizing your delivery route or delivery number? Again, all of these help you realize that the features that you select and the assumptions that you make sort of are guided by these W questions, 
which most people as machine learning practitioners often ignore. But it's quite crucial that people end up seeing it. Okay. And then this ties into the part about business bottom line. And by this, I of course mean the evil business department, which is not interested in the purity of the engineering team, but it's about business bottom lines and the decision to launch. So how do you decide that you want to launch your product, right? Again, I believe that this is really a proxy on how you end up visioning your own product or company for the future. The way you launch or the way you update your product is sort of a proxy for where you see your company itself a few years later or maybe even a few months later. For example, metric and objectives. This is one thing which is quite common. So when I mentioned that you need to start collecting your metrics, you need to select most probably one of them as your objective. So when you choose to optimize for a certain metric, it might turn out that most probably the other metrics are going to suffer. If you are going to optimize for something like the number of sales, maybe the average sale price is going to go down. Again, this is an idea of how the company itself looks at its own future and how these model updates of which objectives you optimize for are actually a proxy to your business goal. And again, similar to the earlier credit card example, false positives and false negatives. Both of these are bad, but which one is the worst evil, right? Do you want to let the one person who conducted a fraud transaction through? Or do you want to put a hassle and break on the thousands of people who just look like they are yeah, false positives? Again, these sort of model updates are parameters which end up being a decision which needs to be made together with not just yourself, but an idea of how it affects the business bottom line. So, uh, is this the end? Is all of this covered? I, I don't think so, right? It's worth putting all of it together. So when you start with your data, you go about building it, pre-processing it, you construct your own mental model of how it's all structured, you end up integrating it into your systems, and then the idea is that you set yourself up for success in any of these projects by being able to get a workflow in place, and then if you miss most of my talk, it's in three words, which is simplify as much as possible, measure your results, whether it's initially or during monitoring, and then be prepared to iterate. I think iteration is the part where you end up really deploying successful systems. So uh, that was my talk for today. It's machine learning from access to production. If you're interested in the slides, you can scan this QR code. It'll take you back to the talk funnel page. There are a whole bunch of references which I strongly suggest you check out. Most of them are about successful big companies. But of course, you can all find it here. And Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions and answers. Can you hear me? Already having the metrics empty, and you are doing a technical extraction uh, for Flipkart. Will you say that this data pre processed by Snapdeal or it is to the right. Okay, so the question was I think in maybe two parts. Let me just understand if you have two different domains, do we share the data from one in the other? Or so if okay, so when it comes to our own system. We, of course, have a whole bunch of transfer learning and processing in place where we end up seeing that data which is used in one context can often significantly boost. So as a data scientist, most often you realize these patterns and then it does help to take these learnings and then apply them in a different context. But if you look at the raw data itself, we do not support taking data from one store and then giving it to another store. That's something here. Yeah. Okay, so okay, looking back at semantic tree or the specific part that we do, we do do deduplication across stores. So if the same product is sold at multiple stores, we treat it as one product. So we make sure that the same product contains the best sort of information which is possible, irrespective. So, but have you seen the different uh, behavior in response to user of the same product across different stores? Have you seen the user behavior? Uh, I'm not sure if. It's really apparent. We don't get that information from the store owners, but I would think that better structured data is definitely better. You've seen the more popular stores, 
make sure that their data is uh, much more higher quality. Yes, that actually makes perfect sense. The question is, when you start with a model which is say 90% accurate, do you see the performance degrading over time? That's something we see quite regularly. I think each model comes with its own half-life value. And then the idea is to keep monitoring the results as much as possible. You need to have some other loops of verification that ties into the versioning, the testing, and the monitoring part. So you really need to hold out on a data set and make sure that you're able to collect these data sets from time to time the snapshots are not just across segments but also in a temporal dimension. Yes, so again, those are like fairly valid points. I'm quite sure that you have had these problems over the past. Uh, just being able to train a model to a certain threshold currently, maybe 98, that's not going to be 98 two weeks later. So maybe a trade-off is being able to deploy a good enough model now and then make sure it remains good enough. So the perfect today and worst point tomorrow. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Um, again, I think this really depends. So the idea is that when do you know that the model is good enough to replace another? When do you make sure that one of them is good enough you can roll it out, right? One against an ensemble. One against an ensemble. So my idea was that the ensemble is also treated as one. So when I look at model, again, it's a model below a model below a model. The idea is that you think of it as a business decision, or maybe you can actually think of it as the A-B testing approach, right? If you end up being able to segment your own user space into maybe statistically significant portions, if you're able to do a hopefully cheap test, not too expensive in terms of what losses it will entail, so that you can test your model against your ensemble, that might be the best way to look at it. How long you do it, uh, there's no straightforward answer, I think. It's about being under understanding what data you're looking at, whether that data is significantly going to change next year or not. Thank you very much. I still okay. have the talk that it had the most likes. <laughs> Our next event is an off-air event. So we're going to be turning off the live stream, turning off all the video cameras, so that you guys.